If someone spent all day fishing in World of Warcraft, few people would question whether or not they could earn themselves the moniker of gamer, whatever that means. But if the same person spent all day fishing in Animal Crossing, more people would be on the fence about whether or not they should be considered one. Why do some people consider MMORPGs to be realer gaming experiences than cozy games? I was initially going to make this video about how MMORPGs and cozy games are so similar and that their differences in legitimacy can be traced back to their different gendered cultural significance. One is considered for men and one is considered to be for women, no matter how much men or women actually play either genre. And that is a factor and I will talk about it, but thanks to some of my followers, I realized that if I only talked about this factor, I would be missing out on an opportunity here because Beyond the gender stuff, there are some actual key differences between the two genres. And what's interesting is that these are the differences that make the difference between a legitimate genre and a less legitimate genre in the eyes of gatekeepers, but also subtly in the minds of average players. I mean, maybe some of you have magically escaped this rhetoric, but honestly, even I, the simp for accessibility, have internalized it a little bit as well. For example, I have a gut respect for World of Warcraft players, but that could just be because I respect my elders. So by finding out what's similar about the two genres and what's different, we can learn why cozy games feel less real to some people beyond just sexism. And that will make for a more nuanced, more interesting, and frankly, more accurate conversation. First though, let's talk about what a cozy game is. Because the funny thing is, Cozy game, as a genre, encompasses so many different mechanics. You have something like Pikmin, which is basically a baby RTS. You have something like Gris, which is a puzzle platformer. Or something like Atelier, which is a turn-based JRPG. So really what I'm focusing on here is the life sim subset of cozy games. That's the subset of cozy gaming which most resembles an MMORPG. These are your Animal Crossings, your Stardew Valleys, your Sims. Games where you perform core, simple tasks without significant risk of failure and which often come with a degree of world or character customization, like building your own farm or managing people and a focus on relationship building. From here on out, when I say cozy game, what I really mean is life sim cozy game, but without all the extra fluff. I'll be talking about a few different cozy games and MMORPGs, but I'll be using Stardew Valley and World of Warcraft as the primary examples for this video because they really lay down the blueprint for what life sims and MMORPGs respectively have looked like since. I should say that I have played a little bit of both genres, but they're not really the main thing I play, so I wouldn't consider myself an expert in those genres by any means. I have watched high-level gameplay, I'm familiar with the core concepts, I did get feedback from followers with more experience than me, so I understand what happens in both games, but I might, I probably will, miss some of the nuances from a more submerged MMORPG or cozy game experience. Essentially, this is just a theory. Please feel free to disagree with me in the comments. Respectfully though, I'm a little bit scarred by TikTok. Hey, it's Future Grey here. I wanted to come here and mention that just like I'm not talking about all cozy games, I'm also not talking about all MMORPGs. There's just so much variation within any one genre. So I'm talking specifically about MMORPGs where you can't rely purely on skill to progress. You do need to level up and grind to some extent. Apparently there are MMORPGs where you don't have to do this and you can rely purely on skill from the get-go, but I'm not really talking about those because they're just so different from cozy games that there aren't any valuable parallels that we can extract from the two. Okay. Let's get into this shit. This was initially what drew my attention to the overlap between MMORPGs and cozy games. In both genres, tasks are rewarded in two ways. Some tasks are rewarded by making your character better at completing tasks. In Stardew Valley, this is acquiring the right materials from the mine and being rewarded with a sprinkler, which will water your crops without any of your input. This will allow you to build out your farm further or spend more time away from the now well-watered crops. In World of Warcraft, it's picking herbs and mixing those herbs to be rewarded with a potion that will keep you fighting enemies more effectively. This makes your character better at being a DPS or a tank or whatnot. However, some tasks when completed are not rewarded with that kind of concrete improvement. Instead, they are rewarded with access to better tasks, and those tasks could net you helpful stuff, or could just help you, again, gain access to more tasks. 
For example, while you're picking all of those herbs in World of Warcraft, you're leveling up in herbalism. Once you train yourself to higher tiers of the profession, you'll be able to pick herbs you couldn't before. And picking those herbs will allow you to craft more useful or more specific potions, elixirs, etc. When you strip away all of the gift wrapping from both genres, that's what you get. Doing tasks to get better at doing tasks. There are other genres like MOBAs, puzzle games, walking simulators, sports games, and competitive first-person shooters that don't share this gameplay loop. And there are genres like RPGs or solo first-person shooters that do. Here's where I tell you that I'm sure you could make this exact video essay with some other games that share cozy game characteristics. Games with this exact gameplay loop. That said, I was more interested in making this essay on MMORPGs because of how much more high status they are than cozy games, how undiluted the aforementioned gameplay loop is in them, meaning the loop remains relatively undisrupted by plot rewards the way it might be in other genres, and because of what I'll discuss next, the low skill floor. This will undoubtedly be the most controversial portion of this video, because it strikes a nerve. No one wants to be told that the game they play doesn't require that much skill. It feels like it invalidates the effort and thinking people put into playing either of these genres. To clarify, a lot of people who play MMORPGs and cozy games are very, very skilled. I'll actually touch on this more later. What I'm talking about is the skill floor. How much skill you need to play the game at all. In cozy games, there are few or no failure states. If you don't grow enough blueberries, you're not going to be gutted for it. Similarly, farming enemies and grinding non-combat skills in MMORPGs tend not to require much skill. There are always enemies and herb bushes that are at or below your level and that you would find it difficult to fail at tackling. Any level can be attained simply by grinding and, if the MMORPG requires it, throwing in some real-life money. Even at the highest level of many MMORPGs, you're still going to be spending so much of your time grinding for buffs, potions, equipment, even if it's to prepare yourself for more challenging tasks. During that time, not much concentration or skill is required. I couldn't find an exact percentage on this, but from what I've seen online, most of the World of Warcraft audience doesn't spend all of their time doing or prepping for endgame rating. There is a huge casual player base. Clearly, you don't have to be immensely skilled to just play something like World of Warcraft and to have fun with it. MMORPGs like World of Warcraft are designed with non-rating quests to fulfill, houses to build, friendships to make. Most of the players remain comfortably steeped in very grind-heavy, low-skill mechanics. That's just the skill floor, however. The skill ceiling is a whole other matter. To complete a high-level raid in World of Warcraft, each member performs a long series of time-sensitive moves, skills, movement, taking potions, etc. in coordinated tandem. And due to the low margin for error, any screw-up from any one member can jeopardize the entirety of the operation. If one person loads up a skill on a target that's about to die, the target can die before the spell even strikes them. Subsequently, that person will waste the entirety of that skill time, and that can snowball to the point where the enemy outlasts lasts their whole team by a small margin. High-level raids across MMORPGs are generally designed to be a challenging option for those who want to invest the time and resources into group success. And that's exactly what raids are. They are an option. You don't require skill to play an MMORPG, but it can give you access to a whole new segment of the game and all of the cultural capital and great loot that comes along with it. Even if you participate in raiding in general, there is also a gradient of difficulty. There are easier raids, where the skill floor is lower and you don't have as narrow a margin of error. Those are different from the high-level raids I was talking about. For example, according to the World of Warcraft wiki, very good gear can be obtained with comparative ease by completing the daily badge quest, doing the 10-player raids, and occasional 25-player raids. Gear obtained this way is just one tier below the best stuff available and with rather low effort. The remaining PvE challenge are the 25-player hard modes. The motivation for trying this is not gear, but rather the wish to master something really difficult. It's about building and maintaining a team, a close-knit group of players who progress together. The most happy raid members are those who join a run because they like the challenge of the encounters, no matter whether it's a wipe night, a first kill, or a farm run. In fact, high-level raids are special because not everyone chooses to participate in them. Not everyone can either due to skill or resources. I would argue that the role of skill in World of Warcraft and other MMORPGs as something that adds to the gaming experience while not being mandatory at all, resembles the role of skill in cozy gaming. First up is mechanical skill. In World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy XIV, that's the ability of a person to click effectively between character actions, to move and dodge well. In cozy gaming, mechanical skill can also help. 
It allows you to access parts of the game that might otherwise slap you in the face with failure states. For example, you can fail to reach lower levels of the Skull Cavern in Stardew if you aren't skilled enough. Though, admittedly, the skill ceiling isn't as high on something like the Skull Cavern, since combat is not designed to be as challenging. You can really only be so good at killing slimes. Similarly, fishing can be pretty difficult, and low-skill Stardew players can be barred from catching legendary fish in much the same way that a low-skill World of Warcraft player might be gatekept from raiding for being too bad at clicking. There is also systems design skill. If you are more skilled at planning out passive income, which is something you can do with many interactive systems and cozy games, you will accrue money at entirely different speeds. Here, the skill ceiling is far higher. At the beginning of Stardew, each player is given the same resources, and the amount of money you make scales tremendously with skill. It's a capitalist stream. The more efficiently you build your farm, the more output will be generated per unit of your input. That means that you can be so much better than someone at optimizing output that you are making millions of dollars more than them in the same amount of time. This type of skill determines how much time you get to spend doing other stuff while still maintaining progress. It determines whether you hit certain in-game or community-generated achievements. These are things you can fail at. After year two, your grandpa might come in and tell you that you did a bad job on your farm because you weren't effective enough. Then there's long-term planning, which is related to systems design, but beyond just spatial organization, involves the allotment of time. If you only have 28 days with 20 hours in each to plant a certain type of crop and pick up certain types of plants, it takes skill to distribute that time in such a way that resources gained are maximized. Finally, there's creative skill. Creating a more aesthetically beautiful home, farm, character, or whichever other customizable playpen given to you by the game, that scales with aesthetic intuition and ability, something that scales almost infinitely. In Animal Crossing, it is always possible to find someone who terraformed their island more beautifully than you, and it is possible to resent them for being so good at something so strangely specific. There is no in-game measure of aesthetic beauty, but nonetheless, it is an achievement. It is something that a player can do, starting out with the same tools as everyone else, yet achieving far more. What's funny is that a lot of MMORPGs let you use creative skill and long-term planning skill to varying degrees. Final Fantasy XIV is coming out with a whole cozy game-esque expansion that will let you live out your rustic farmer dreams. But it is true that mechanical skill tends to make a larger impact on your experience in an MMORPG than in a cozy game. That's actually the first clear difference that we're going to discuss in this essay. It is a particularly salient distinction because it comes to the forefront of a lot of discussions around cozy games and MMORPGs. People will say, well, participants in MMORPGs RPG raids are investing a ton of skill into them. How could you say that the same amount of skill is being employed to play what amounts to a cookie clicker clone? saith the droves. What these people tend not to mention is that they are only mentioning and caring about one type of skill, mechanical skill. Thanks to these people, we can learn something about what we, the culture surrounding gaming, care about. We, the culture, tend to place a disproportionate amount of value on mechanical skill. Part of this is that, well, mechanical skill just looks impressive. I will sometimes just watch clips of people in Valorant gunning poor little guys down. I'll admit it, we all indulge. Mechanical skill just makes for a punchy, watchable clip. Conversely, it's harder to capture the work put into building a million dollar a week farm, and even an hour long time lapse doesn't really capture the underlying thought process, no matter how intelligent that process actually is. Beyond that, mechanical skill has been embedded in the medium of video games and its history. The earliest games were racing games, sports simulators, space shooters. Video game genres assume movement. If there is none, you add the qualifier turn-based. In the absence of such a qualifier, like if the game is tagged just first person and adventure, we can assume that we will be moving the character and attacking in real time, requiring some measure of mechanical skill. Movement is the baseline. And I'm sure we'll even get some commenters explaining why they think mechanical skill should outrank creative and design-based skill, so that'll honestly save me from explaining it further. We just like the shooty shooty punch stuff. Now I'm going to throw a bit of a wrench in the previous point, because there are MMORPGs that don't involve mechanical skill. Dofus, for example, is a turn-based MMORPG, and if you look at the type of skill that makes you good at Dofus, it's really similar to what makes you good at Stardew Valley. In Dofus combat, you're deciding when to use a move, what move to use, where and from where to use that move, and who to use that move on. And to make those decisions, you're taking in all sorts of different information to optimize the desired outcome, which is the death of your enemies. Meanwhile, high-skill Stardew farmers are out there deciding when to plant a crop, what to plant, and where to plant. 
And to make those decisions, these farmers are taking in information like the season, long-term plot availability, selling price, buying price, the opportunity cost of planting this versus something else, the spatial efficiency of planting this given the space they have in what other crops they are meant to plant, the efficiency with which they can water these crops every morning in conjunction with other plots which might require a different watering pattern, etc. All to optimize their desired outcome, which is not death, probably, but rather making more money. Really, neither is that much more impressive than the other. So if decision-making doesn't really differ that much, what does? What actually makes the difference for us in deciding that turn-based MMORPGs are any more real than cozy games? Well, first we have failure states. In Dofus, you can die, you can lose. The existence of clear and designated failure states adds another layer of pressure to decision-making. And the second is sort of related to the first. It's the wrapping that the decision-making is given. Combat. Combat seems to feel more inherently gamery. Combat also tends to make those failure states feel more punishing, though I'd argue that disappointing grandpa in Stardew can also make you feel pretty bad. It's interesting that we see punishment and butting heads as determinants of gaming legitimacy. I mean, there are reasons to prefer combat. You could argue that combat settings generate adrenaline and that they provide an outlet for bloodlust. You could argue that people gravitate towards games that can grant them that outlet. I pretty much exclusively play combat games. I guess for this reason, I find the Doom kill animations more viscerally satisfying than something like the I Caught a Fish animations from Animal Crossing. But just because a lot of us personally prefer combat feel, it doesn't explain why we as the culture value video games as an outlet for bloodthirst more than video games as an outlet for creativity. Especially given that so many of these people who play cozy games clearly enjoy the latter as such. I believe that we can trace this attitude back partly to the heavy influence of TTRPGs on video games early on. TTRPGs have always been pretty centered around fighting, or at least around a combat-heavy setting. We can also credit partly the way that video games have been advertised in the past. From their ad campaigns, it's clear that video game companies saw combat as a selling point for boys, and that early push to associate fighting with video games likely helped solidify a link between a game being cool and its combat being cool. Oh yeah, Tekken 4 is here. Punish your enemies with new moves, interactive environments, and new fighters. I also think that we value combat in part because we value competition. There is not a lot of competition built into cozy games, either with real-life people or with NPCs. Most of the time, you aren't really beating or conquering anyone. In Stardew, for example, you get along with everyone in town. I mean, everyone has a character that they despise in Stardew, but the game doesn't really let you act on it. And if you go co-op, you can have independent farms, but the game is still designed for cooperative play. Though, now that I'm thinking about it, competitive Stardew farm growing would be, like, kind of incredible. Anyways, as it stands, you don't really play Stardew to feel any kind of domination over an opponent. So how, then, do players of cozy games view the role of play? According to Sudden Smith, there are seven value systems or rhetorics through which people discuss play. Play as progress, play as fate, play as power, play as identity, play as self, and play as a frivolous activity. For him, these are rhetorics. They are ways to speak of and conceive of play. He uses it in the more broad, cultural sense, but we can also use his theoretical work to discuss how players undergo their own play experiences. Writer Vic Hood in How Stardew Valley Helped Me Cope with Depressive Episodes explains how she found task completion to be a substitute to productivity in real life. The progress made by someone in Stardew can actually feel like progress. Especially when one feels helpless in day-to-day -day life, a player can become enthralled by the feeling that they are making an impact, that they are producing in-game value for their character and for the residents of a town. This would be akin to what Sudden Smith calls play as progress. When playing a cozy game, you might also engage in play as self, meaning you play it as a solitary activity to evolve your own sense of self. You might alternatively play it as identity, to advance your identity in a community through play. This might mean that you found a Stardew Discord or subreddit, and that you're engaging in the game to consolidate the online community and your role in it. Or you might play Stardew as a frivolous activity, as a kind of subversion of productivity, like playing it during your workday to say, screw it, I'm not selling my labor today. Well, I am, but to Harvey and he's a good guy, I don't find it. You can absolutely engage in these forms of play in an MMORPG, especially if you tend to strike out on your own collecting flowers for the pure thrill of it. But MMORPGs, more than cozy games, encourage you to play them as identity and as power. 
First, play as identity. In MMORPGs, you don't need to seek out a community with which to identify, because community is built into the game. It's part of the pitch. Every time you log on and you invest in a guild, you feel like you're a part of something. You're performing your identity in the collective. Now, play as power refers to play as a form of conflict. In MMORPGs, not only does combat pit you against the enemies in their world, combat also pits you against fellow players. Succeeding on a raid doesn't just show that you're good, it shows that you're better than other players and other guilds. Detailed leaderboards exist for both PvE and PvP, so you get to know exactly where you stand. In MMORPGs, the two, identity and conflict, become interwoven. One World of Warcraft raider told me that there is an app that works to exclude those who don't measure up in skill from participating in raids. An elitism festers in some corners of the scene because performance means something there. It has cultural capital. Being good can be your ticket into a community. Again, because people really talk up raiding as the determinant of MMORPG legitimacy, and raiding usually takes the form of play as power and play as identity, we can see that these approaches to play seem to be valued. The culture likes competition, and it likes belonging. And it likes belonging earned through competition. To recap, there seems to be more legitimacy assigned to game genres from mechanical skill, combat, and which encourage play as power and play as identity. This isn't all gendered, of course, I don't want to squeeze it all under one lens, but part of male socialization does involve an emphasis on competition, conquering, combat, so it's no wonder that the genre coded as most feminine gets left to the wayside. I see misogyny in these discourses about competitiveness and skill as discursive clusters that interact with each other and reinforce each other. The devaluation of the feminine, I'm sure, reinforces the idea that video games should be competitive and bloodthirsty, and then these now taken-for-granted qualities, like competitiveness and bloodthirst, are fed back into the culture as justifications for the exclusion of women from gaming. When, as we've seen, these female-coded games, there's just as much real games as the male-coded ones. Anyways, that brings us to the end of the essay. Do go over to my Kofi to help me buy more games that I can video essay upon. I think I'm going to be legally unable to receive money in a few weeks, so this would be the time to help me out.